Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a mammoth discovery, Ice Age Archaeology in Alaska. I'd like to begin by saying that this work is a collaborative effort and led by our team um, of four principal investigators. Brian Weigel, that's me. Kate Krasinski is our zooarchaeologist from Adelphi and Barbara Crass, a research associate with the Museum of the North, and Chuck Holmes with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We're also joined today by our lead research assistant, Julio Ruz Diaz, Diaz senior uh, at Adelphi University. And before I begin, please feel free to use the chat feature and send your questions to Kate or Julio and they will compile these into a Q&A session following our talk. As people are still jumping into the meeting, I'll quickly run through some of our acknowledgement slides. First, we are presenting from Shuanaki, Wampo no Mom, also known as Huam Naki, translated loosely as the Island of Shells or Long Island. And our research takes place on Diné land at Debe De Na, Sheephorn Creek, along the Tanana River, Tetfietu, or Major River. Today, Sheephorn Creek is known as Shaw Creek in interior Alaska. Our interdisciplinary project has benefited from the work of many contributing researchers, and I'll be mentioning some of their preliminary results today. Um, several of these uh, later in our talk, um, I'll, I'll draw attention to. I also wanna thank my terrific undergraduate and graduate student research assistants who have worked in the lab and field over the years. We really could not have accomplished any of this work without their contributions. We especially thank all of the field school students for their contributions um, over the four years we've been excavating at Holtzman. So far, 63 students representing 49 universities from all over the United States, Canada, China, and Australia have joined us. We thank all of you for all of this hard work that it takes to excavate a site like this. Finally, we wanna thank Chuck Holmes and Barbara Crass for their mentorship and participation in this project. Without their dedication, we would know very little about prehistory in Shaw Creek. Today, we'll be presenting our work from the Holtzman site, which is along Shaw Creek as it pertains more broadly to the Pleistocene peopling of the Western Hemisphere and human cultural adaptations to unique environments. We are intrigued by what was the last major continental migration of fully modern humans at the end of the last ice age. When did the first people enter the Western continents that we call the Americas today? Based on the archeological evidence, which may differ from oral tradition, we'll present here the physical re and material remains left behind by those early colonists, explorers. We know they crossed over from Asia, but what was it like to enter the, an entire hemisphere that was completely devoid of other people at that time? Were they driven by wanderlust? Were they searching for the last of the woolly mammoths or larger game species that had gone extinct over in Europe and Asia? What routes did they take? Was it an inland or a coastal migration? To do this, today we're going to talk about the specific archaeological evidence from the older components at the Holtzman site and how that pertains to um, these important questions. And we'll start by introducing you all to the greater Shaw Creek area, a region that's very rich in Ice Age archaeology. Then we'll talk specifically 
about the Holtzman site by starting at the surface and digging our way back in time. Our objective is to show you artifacts as they were discovered in their primary contexts so that you'll be seeing a lot of pictures and maps from the field. We know the first people crossed from Asia to Alaska via a land bridge, which was exposed by lower sea levels during the late Pleistocene. Some things we, we do not um, know, some of the items we don't know include, how long were they in Beringia before they started moving south? And how many waves of separate migrations were there? And specifically, when and which, by which direction did they arrive? In a process that should be quite familiar to us today, the melting of continental ice sheets causes rising oceans. So during the height of the last ice age, the world's oceans were about 300 meters lower than they are today. This exposed large tracts of continental shelf that are currently underwater as that oceanic water was tied up in massive continental glaciers. Other researchers are working areas along the coastal route, searching for the earliest signs of people along a hypothesized coastal migration route. But that work is made more difficult primarily because much, but not all, of the late Pleistocene coastline is submerged today. Our research takes place in interior Alaska, in the center of what we call Eastern Beringia the northern gateway to what was once an ice-free corridor through the continental ice sheets covering Canada. So people at some point were able to migrate by land through Canada um, through what is known as an ice-free corridor. In the lower 48 states, there are over 800 known sites related to Clovis occupations of North America. Clovis is known by its distinctive fluted point technology and is often cited as the earliest documented technology in the Americas south of the continental Canadian ice sheets. These Clovis sites date between 13,400 and 12,700 calibrated radiocarbon years before present or what we call CalBP. It's roughly equivalent to years ago, but not to get too technical, it's years before 1950. Arguments for a pre-Clovis occupation of this area are not universally accepted. Listed here are sites in Eastern Beringia that are older than 13,000 years ago, and three sites that we know of with evidence older than 14,000 years ago. Those include Swan Point, McDonald Creek, and the Holtzman site, all in this um, interior Alaska area, the middle Tananal Valley. The Tananal River flows from the Yukon ter Territory through interior Alaska, where it eventually converges with the Yukon River. In the inset map that you see here, you can see where Shaw Creek lies north of the central Alaska range in a cluster of these early sites. The 14,000 year old sites are highlighted in red. You can also see this continental ice sheet that covers much of Canada. Uh, you can see that the coastal regions are exposed here in South Central Alaska, yet there are no sites in that area that are of this age. Same thing you'll notice is there are no early sites along the coastal route, which was blocked by continental ice as well. And we have no really early sites through this hypothesized ice-free corridor. Now the data of this map is, this is old data from about 2003, which suggests this ice extent at 13,000 years Cal BP. The Clovis sites are in gray. So before we really talk about Holtzman, I want to talk more about briefly this ice-free um, corridor. So, it's critical to the question of the timing of all of this is the opening of that ice-free corridor through Canada as it pertains to this whole epic story of the human past. 
When this corridor opened is critical to understanding when the first people moved south of the ice sheets. So I want to mention one of several recent articles on this topic. Manuqua and others state the following on the timing of this important corridor. Quote, based on retreat stages, the first time Western Alberta was passable was approximately 15,000 years or earlier. Referring to the glacial ice, it, quote, would not, would not have been an insurmountable impediment to human migration. Continuing, quote, archeological evidence south of the ice sheets that point to a Pacific coastal adaptation does not in any way preclude that an inland corridor may have been used by humans who ultimately settled in the interior of the Americas prior to 14,000 years ago." End quote. So this is Shaw Creek where it converges with the middle Tananal River. One of the ways we address these questions is to build a solid radiocarbon chronology from different sites across the landscape. Cultural activity from Shaw Creek demonstrate a more or less continuous occupation of the area throughout the end of the last ice age. In this slide, you can see where key sites, Swan Point, Mead, and Broken Mammoth, occur in relation to the Holtzman site where we've been working. And on the right side of this, you can see the radiocarbon calibration chart representing the earliest dates from the sites and where Holtzman evidence lies in comparison. It's important that I point out here that these are dates on bone and or charcoal and none of these dates are on ivory. What you'll notice is uh, when we get into these earlier components, um, ivory can have an older age because people were scavenging ancient ivory at the time. And the radiocarbon dates uh, date the specific time when the organism died or, or stopped ingesting carbon. So we're very careful to give you dates that are not ivory in most of this. I'll tell you when, when we're dating ivory artifacts. It is useful to date ivory though because it tells you the age of the mammoths that they were utilizing as well. So uh, for reference here, the ice age ends just after 12,000 years ago. Um, so all of these dates here fall within the Pleistocene or the ice age period. And here's a view from Holtzman after we've backfilled. Um, we try as best as we can to really leave no trace in the area. It is a destructive process to excavate a site like this. We discovered Holtzman in 2015 on a gentle eastward slope overlooking Shaw Creek, about one mile north of its confluence with the middle Tananal River. A component is a collection of artifacts that are associated with each other in time and space. A component could represent 1,000 years of repeated visits to a, to a site, or a component could represent a single occupation with a handful of artifacts. Here's the soil profile at Holtzman. It's primarily windblown silts in the top one and a half meters and windblown sands at the bottom um, portion of this profile. And because it's all aeolian or windblown silts, Anything really larger than a small grain is probably transported up there, not by geological processes. There's no colluvium or downward um, rocks rolling into this particular site. So it makes for really easy digging in this area. There are eight distinctive artifact components ranging from the historic period, a single shell casing, and in this area, that dates to around 1905, the historic period. Um, and other artifacts that go back to the late glacial or the end of the ice age. Notice how the thin organic horizon is at the top and it's followed in sequence below that with a dark reddish brown, uh, darkish red or brown 
we commonly call this forest brown horizon beneath that um, forest floor. This is very typical of a boreal forest so soil profile. It's also important um, that these are deeply buried. Uh, well, notice these down here low, these dark stringers. These are deeply buried A horizons. Some kind, sometimes they're called stringers here in this area, which were, uh, they're natural, but they're enhanced by human activities because people tend to add organic matter um, on the surfaces that they're occupying. So they get darker with presence of humans. The importance of sites in this area here in Shaw Creek is that there's very little to no disturbances. There's no cryoturbation or freezing and thawing that impact these deposits. So we get very nicely stratified or separated snapshots of the human past. And here you can also see the vertical separation um, between some of these early components as much as 10 in some places, 20 centimeters separate components four and component five. In our photos, you probably noticed the boreal forest on the surface, the modern surface, but we know from previous work that the area was considered a semi-arid grassland environment, commonly called the Mammoth Steppe during the last ice age. Therefore, this area was completely devoid of trees or mostly devoid of trees, and it was a grassland. Here's some preliminary work being done by Beth Shapiro and her graduate student, Sabrina Shirazi at the University of California, Santa Cruz. These are results of environmental DNA, which were, were recovered from five of the six soil samples that you see here in the profile picture. This particular test was focused on finding plant DNA, and the results are consistent with previous pollen data recovered from cores and regional lakes by Nancy Bigelow and the University of Alaska Fairbanks and, and other workers in the area. So it's important because it demonstrates the transition from grasses and forbs, that mammoth step, to a forested or park-like environment with trees by 9,000 years ago. It's also important because it further demonstrates the stratigraphic integrity of the Holtzman site. I really look forward to doing more research uh, along these lines. The results are interesting because you'll see, as you'll see as we um, go on and look at some of these hearths and, and remnant features, we have woody charcoal in layers dating to 12,500 years ago. But there's very little charcoal at all in the older components. So, that's an indication that firewood was difficult to come by on the Mammoth Steppe prior to 13,000 years ago. And if you're interested, I direct you to the research by Barbara Crass, our co-principal investigator on bone hearths and starting fires with grass and burning bones. They make excellent fire fuel for fire, especially when you don't have trees. So from the Ice Age layers here, components four, and I, there's subcomponents here, 4A, 4B, 5A, and 5B, and I've listed the midpoint of all sort of, these aren't averages, but it's the midpoint of the range of radiocarbon dates we get from each of these components here. We've cataloged nearly 4,000 artifacts from components four and five. And it includes a variety of bones and stones. There are gastroliths, which indicate birds. Gastroliths are the small stones that birds will put in their gizzards. There's charcoal in component four. And from component five, we have some red ochre as well. So let's just take a tour of the Holtzman site here. And you'll notice, um, this shape on your left, which is the outline of our excavations over time. You'll see a lot of maps using that shape. And I show you this because it shows you the slope vector of the site. It's a gentle slope and you can see the contour lines here. And just for reference, um, it's uh, two parts to this site. We're at Holtzman South right now, but there is stuff at Holtzman North and you can see a little test pit was dug there, but it's two little fingers that overlook Shaw Creek. It's a very nice gentle slope facing towards the east. 
So here I have gold arrows. This excavation block matches this corner of the excavation. And this one off to the side here matches um, this excavation. And the rest of these maps, this will be north, the top will be north um, in the standard view. So we started in 2015 by digging this one by two test excavation, which came down upon rich, large, broken um, fauna and, and flakes. And we knew we had a very nice site here. And since then we've excavated 84 square meters at the site starting field school projects in 2016. And so you see the history of excavations here and where we dug in what years. And I'll just um, note that the test excavation is located here this, and it was, we did not put it on a north-south grid because we didn't know if we were going to find anything. And then we oriented everything to the north and south. And so you can see the corner of the 2019 excavation block, which is shown here. This is actually showing component five. And we'll talk more about this large flat anvil in component five. As you can see, we dig a lot of earth. Um, we open up large um, sections of the ground and then we backfill it at the end um, of the excavation. So we'll just kind of work backwards in time and you'll notice the excavation maps on the right as we go through this. They'll have the component in your top right. This is component one and the range of radiocarbon dates will be in the top corner here as well of this occupation. So component one is an Athabascan or Diné occupation. It's just some scattered fire cracked rock, a few pieces of bone, a few bits of charcoal and, and of lithics. And you'll also see this gold box is indicating where on the map the photograph is indicating. So you can see they have some fun excavating in the top portions of um, component one where we have to, you know, literally dig through trees. The second component is about 4,500 um, radiocarbon years ago, calibrated. Um, it's mostly a single lithic flint napping event. All of these little black dots are from the reduction of a uh, basalt-like cobble um, into uh, larger flakes that are making a tool. And you can actually see from here where the individual was seated when they were flint napping in this area between the two piles of debitage. Um, there's no bone and, and no charcoal from this layer. So I actually don't have a radiocarbon date, but um, there are components like this around the corner at Broken Mammoth. And so we know it's about 4,500, uh, maybe as much as 6,000 years old. Component three is deeper uh, into the soil profile. There's a long stretch of sterile loose where there are no artifacts before we get deeper into the ground. And component three is um, a loose scatter of mostly fauna and a little bit of charcoal. Um, I think there's a couple of quartz tools in this assemblage. Uh, it dates between 10,400 and 10,200 Cal BP. So we want to spend a little more time here talking about component four. And I've split component four into component four A and the older component four B. Um, you know, as an archaeologist, you want to have your components as tightly associated as possible. So component 4A dates from about 12,000 years ago to roughly 11,200 years ago. Uh, the older component 4B is a, a layer beneath it. Some of these stringers are sandwiched together, and, it, and in this component, it can be hard to separate those in some cases. But component 4B dates from 12,600 or just after the start of a Younger Dryas cold period and goes to about 12,000 years ago. And I'll explain these maps a little bit. The gold circles with a number in it is a radiocarbon date. It's an organic piece that um, we sent into a lab and they told us how old that was. Um, so you can see we've really dated different areas and we're, we're focusing on dating specific activity events rather than you know, broadly whole component. You can see there's quite a lot of fauna here and a few um, lithic pieces of debitage. There's a lot of charcoal in component 4A. They built large hearths. And there's quite a few gastroliths as well. The gray 
um, sort of polygons are hearth features. These are the outlines of old campfires that existed. And we found evidence of them. You can see uh, the burned earth and some of the charcoal just starting to appear in the photograph here next to what is a collection of caribou antlers that were piled up next to this campfire. Unfortunately, in this part of the site, the groundwater kind of runs through there and those antlers were not preserved well enough to save. One of the things we don't do is put bone preservatives on these because we want to do DNA tests or we want to do isotope tests and by you know kind of covering them with with preservative gunk it would even affect the ability to radiocarbon date them. So fauna preservation is excellent across most of the site but in this little corner um, you can see them you can map them but it's hard to recover them. Uh, it is interesting that caribou shows up prominently here uh, because um, there is no mammoth ivory in component four or component 4a. Another view here from um, the middle part of this uh, excavation where we can see this hearth here is starting to emerge in the excavation here. You see the circle of charcoal and burned bone and animal bone fragments and all the little artifact bags of things that were collected at this particular um, swipe of the excavation. There's also this circular feature here which punches through component 4a into the lower component 5 and there's only one of them. Um, it, they dug a hole there, uh, you know, it's in the middle of these three hearths. Without more than one of those features it's difficult to say if that's a post mold or not. Um, but you can see the tightly packed um, artifacts and fauna and lithics surrounding these hearth features. And they made large hearths in this area. And we can tell by the burn spots underneath the hearths that they probably came back and built a campfire on roughly the same spot time after time or repeatedly over time. Um, so, you know, whether they're spending three or four or five days there and every morning they wake up and not make their cup of coffee, but basically start their breakfast campfire. Um, and whether those are really small fires that just accumulate over time, um, you know, those are questions that remain to be seen, but we're starting to see some of the behaviors of these early people uh, during this time. So component 4A, uh, we bulk sample these hearths, we collect the entire hearth fill so we can analyze it in the lab. And from component 4A in this hearth, you can see how we've cross-sectioned the hearth and took bulk samples in the lab while drying it. Uh, we use a black light to look at the hearth material and under a black light, organic matter shows up very well. You can see the black light image in the center. And we found this hair. The hair was running through an intact piece of the hearth that had not yet broken down. So we knew that it was from prehistory. You know, initially I thought it was a field school student's hair, but we knew that it was embedded within the hearth material. So we dated the hearth um, to 11,600 and sent the, the hair first to Dave McMahon in Tennessee and then to Jessica Metcalf, who, who is now um, in Ontario. And they independently looked at it and said it's probably mammoth hair, undercoat mammoth hair. And so you can see here the comparison of the Holtzman hair and their um, root comparisons, this work done by Jess Metcalf, um, in comparison to bison, equus, and homo, or human. And here you can see the medulla cavity of hairs and Holtzman hair doesn't have one and neither does mammoth. But bison and equus or horse have a medulla cavity. So of all these options, this hair is most similar to mammoth. And if we can really confirm this, which I think we're as good as, as we can get, it's too light for a radiocarbon date. Um, this would be equivalent to the last continental mammoth in Alaska. There's another one of the same age, about 300 um, kilometers north of here at Lost Chicken Creek. And so that's a remarkably late mammoth. That's the only evidence of mammoth in component four that we have. There's no ivory and so far no mammoth bones. So just to, before we switch to the lower component, I wanna show you these maps side by side. 
we just talked about component four and some of the things that we found there. And then on the right, you see component 5A. And notice how the activity areas somewhat switch, right? They shift south a little bit. You have some smaller hearths, really strong concentration of artifacts around these hearths. This is classic Lewis Binford working around a hearth kind of artifact distribution that we have here. So the midpoint of the cultural features in component 5A date to about 13,400 with you know, a wider range there going back to about 13,600 on some of these dates. Um, a lot of fauna here and also quite a lot of lithic debitage, which is almost entirely courts or local courts taken from the, the, the bluff that the site is on. So they're not bringing in materials from far away and quartz is really hard to work. Um, but what they are doing is collecting ivory and bashing it um, to make tools. This Most of what's going on in component 5a is large game butchering and mammoth ivory rendering. So here you can see an anvil stone um, a flat stone that was carried up here and used to crack open bones. There's a very large cleaver made out of quartz that was found within two meters of this anvil. And you start to see the emergence of burned earth and burned um, bone in this small cooking hearth. Notice there's no charcoal really in that hearth feature, but the bones are burned to some extent. And, and there are quite a lot of bird bones in here, smaller bones. Uh, in this particular hearth. There's two hearths like this. Um, this one over here by 17 also had some bird bone fragments in it. And then the one we excavated in 2019 over here. So this is a section of a mammoth tusk with quartz scrapers laying on top of it in situ in place and other quartz tools laying next to it. So this really demonstrates what their primary activity is at this site. And that's collection of ivory, and then working it into tools. And here are two of the tools that were produced. These are mammoth ivory rods, one of which is wedge-shaped on the tip of it. And it was broken in half in the ground, so we have a cross-section of it. It's, it's oval, kind of flattened oval. And the longer one has a rounded base um, and is split um, like a plano convex split. Um, if I showed the other side, it's flat. Um, so two different styles of mammoth ivory rods, but very similar to what we see in Clovis sites in the lower 48. I'll mention though that most of the rods, as I've been looking into it, in Clovis sites are a little bit later, dating to around 13,000 years ago, and maybe a little later. And the date on this rod is 13,468. And it occurs within this component that goes as far back as 13,600. So if I'm correct, I think this is one of the earliest ivory rod tools in North America. So there's, a, I mean, there's a ton we can talk about in each of these components, but I want to tell you a little bit about component 5B. And I show you the profile here close up you see these kind of stringers and there's a bone here in component um, 5A, at least 11 centimeters and in some places deeper than that, there's another component underneath. And in this component, there's not as much stuff. It's um, less utilized. You have a kind of a random scatter of fauna um, and some flakes. They're not using quartz at, at this level. The, Lithic or the stone material is brought in from somewhere else. One of the tributaries on closer to the Alaska range, probably it's fine grained chert, which is not what the people of component 5A were using. We also found and sticking out of the wall here, this is mostly sand deposits. And this sand must have accumulated very rapidly because there's not a lot of difference. This bone here is a, or a um, bison rib bone. 
and it dates to about 13,700. You remember the oldest dates in 5A were 13,600. So we're talking about 80 years of deposition here that has piled up. And in this corner, we have little bits of red ochre and this fauna and stuck in the wall here, if you can see it is a stone tool or a, a lithic flake that might've been a utilized flake. And I'll show you a picture here of that in a moment. From the other end of the site down here from last summer, you can see some of the artifacts turning up in that component 5B. Again, you have bones sticking out of component 5A and, and those buried A horizons. It's very faint paleosolar string or organic stringer in this area. It's almost really hard to see, but it is there in, in these bedded sands. And here we have some flakes, chert flakes, and stuck to one of those flakes was a piece of charcoal which we can radiocarbon date. And remember, ivory gives us problematic dates. It might be older than the activities, but bone that's not ivory and charcoal stuck to a flake is pretty good indication that you can date that activity of the humans that were there. So here's what we have from component 5B. We have charcoal stuck to a flake that dates 14,143 to 13,817 calibrated radiocarbon years ago. A bison rib that's a little bit later, so these are probably not at the same time. These are small scale activities that happened some time apart. The bison rib dates to roughly 13,700, 13,600. And in little bits of ochre, which I attempted to take a photograph, sorry, I used my phone for this, but here you see fine pieces of debitage of the chert the larger flake that was stuck in the wall right next to the bison bone. Um, this is actually a basalt. So they were using a workable basalt and then they had some finer grain cherts as well. So a couple of different types of raw materials, but not the local quartz materials. So as we dug into this component initially back in 2016, we didn't know all this other stuff existed then. Um, the students were digging and of course they were tired and they were like, are we done yet? Professor Weigel, are we done? And I said, yeah, you're almost done digging. Let's just take a little more out of that sand just in case. We never find anything down there, but just in case. And they took two swipes with their trowels and, and found something really large. And it looked like this at first. And there's some other little bits of pieces laying around it, but it began to emerge in the sand. And as they dug, they got pretty excited. I don't know of any field school students that have made discoveries quite like this on their first time, you know, excavating. We had to take a notch out of the next unit. So we had, it, it slowed us down in that we had to expand and we had to excavate through all that cultural material and get down um, to be able to recover this in 2016. And I want to thank Kathleen Smith at Georgia Southern University for analyzing this tusk and telling us a little bit about where it came from. It's from the right tusk of a female mammoth, woolly mammoth. Age was probably between 30 and 60 years old. And initially we thought they were scavenging old ivory and caching it there. We couldn't figure out how this tusk got down there by itself. In subsequent years, we found some of this other material. And then I want to thank also the 3D scan by Bernard Means, who emailed me this this morning from Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, it's not the complete scan. It's, you know, it's weathered, so it's fractured into several um, um, different pieces, but he's putting the pieces back together, and this is nearly the complete tusk. It's not all there yet. Um, but what we have is a bison rib bone, and you see the radiocarbon dates, a charcoal with flakes, and then two dates on the tusk, which overlap with the charcoal stuck to a flake. So we see the first stages of people entering Shaw Creek here, picking up a tusk, which is very valuable raw material for them, especially in the absence of trees, and sitting on this slope above Shaw Creek. And they, there's no indication they actually did anything with this particular tusk. They just, there's no other mammoth remains. And, 
mammoth don't drop tusks like you know caribou drop antlers so we considered a maniport that was carried up to this area so let me just kind of wrap up here and then we can move on to some questions um, to conclude our mammoth discovery talk we've we've told you about the chronology stone tools animal remains including hair and hearths from the Holtzman site as they address long-standing questions on the timing and cultural adaptations of the Pleistocene peopling of the Americas, the last continental migration of anatomically modern humans into um, the Western Hemisphere. From Holtzman, we have learned mammoth ivory from at least three different mammoths were used and probably more, it was at least collected. No direct evidence of hunting mammoth yet, Likely there's more, um, if we date more of the ivory, we can determine that. We know that they use that ivory to make ivory tools. There's clear preference for ivory during this period, and there's technological similarities in the use of ivory in the form of the ivory rods to Clovis behaviors down south. But we, we do not have fluted points in Alaska at this time, I'll make that clear. Fluted points being the diagnostic artifact of Clovis. In reconstructing the experiences of these very first people, we know people were in interior Alaska near the opening of the ice-free corridor before 14,000 years ago. About the same time or a little bit after that, they migrated south of those ice sheets. They made large campfires or hards repeatedly, roughly in the same location. So there's probably multiple visits to the Holtzman site as they occupied this this um, Shaw Creek. We know they consumed birds as well as big game. As their climates changed, we know that they adapted their lifestyles to survive by using less and less mammoth ivory and more caribou or antlers. Ice Age sites do not occur along the coastal route or if there are any, they're less convincing. I'm, I'm thinking of those that have been found in British Columbia. They're less convincing than the evidence that's found here at Shaw Creek. That's not to say a coastal migration did not occur. It's only that the evidence for an inland continental migration is currently stronger. And I know there'll be some questions about that um, from some of the people in our audience. So with that, I thank you all for listening. And um, I'd like to allow Professor Krasinski then to chime in um, with some of, the, to some of the questions from the chat. Do we have Professor Krasinski there? Here we go. Hi, everybody. Um, so, yeah, we have quite a few questions coming in here, um, and that was really exciting to see all of the excavation photos coming in um, together like that. Um, and it looks like the questions are coming in in several major themes, so maybe we can start with those. Uh, so we have some questions about the hair. Um, are we finding um, other hairs? What species did we compare um, this specimen to? How did it get there? Um, so I'll, I'll take that one. We have found some other fragments of hairs from component 4A and they're smaller, so they're harder to identify because they don't have all the parts and they're, they're identified just as ungulate hair. And that's the best we got. And there aren't very many. How did it get there? I'm not gonna speculate. It was not there while the fire was burning or it would have melted. So it must have fallen in like right after the fire was put out, I assume. Other than that, your guess is, is I try not to speculate about those things. Um, also, another question came up about how are those ivory rods used as a tool? Um, and if you don't mind, if I just jump in there. Please. 
You know, it's interesting because there's actually quite a bit of research about this and, and in some ways we still don't know precisely what those ivory rods were. Um, there are hypotheses that they may have been used as wedging tools, for example, um, to wedge bones apart, uh, sort of like you would during uh, butchering an animal. But we don't know for sure. There's a lot of experimental archaeology there um, that needs to be done to really address that question. So good projects out there for you. Um, Here's so. Here's a question about Bringian standstill and how do you think Holtzman fits into um, to the concept of a Bringian standstill population before the first peopling of the Americas? Well, that's a great question. Um, Bringia standstill is still a hypothesis, one that I support. The way it fits in is that Swan Point, McDonald Creek. Holtzman are the earliest physical evidence we have of people in this in eastern or western well eastern Beringia and they had to have gotten there somehow because it's pretty far you know uh, into Alaska we don't know where the parent populations were before that or how long they had been there we also don't know how long they were in say the Bering or Chukchi Strait area because that's all underwater so Alaska is wilderness. There's only three highways here and much of it is unexplored. So the sites have to be there somewhere. Um, we haven't found them yet. So what we're, the work we're doing is trying to locate and learn as much as we can about those early sites. Um, but right now we're, we're at 14,000 years. There are a lot of questions piling in. I'll just pose a few to you. Um, how long do the excavations take? Uh, what are your next steps? Uh, what do you think the significance of the red ochre is? Um, and also I wanna make sure to, um, I've had several people ask, how do interested viewers access today's recording? Okay, so how long do the excavations take? About five weeks start to finish. Uh, when we run field, you probably all are familiar with our field schools, or uh, many of you are. Um, and so about five weeks to, to dig down and, and to backfill. Um, the other question was about red ochre. You know, it's small bits of red ochre. I don't think it's naturally occurring. It's associated with artifacts. We know that Clovis used red ochre in their caches of ivory rods. Uh, we know red ochre was widely used in the Paleolithic of Europe. Um, and across the river is the upward sun infant and child burials that date to the early Holocene. So several thousand years, two or 3000 years after what we're talking about, but they had they were buried with red ochre as well. Um, you know, it's not covering any tools or anything. So maybe we'll learn more about that in the future. Um, and the third part of that question was, oh yeah, I'll, I will, this is being recorded and I'll post it to YouTube and I can email the link out to everyone. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, can you talk about how did we uh, know where to dig and how did that fit in with our main um, goals of the project? Well, you were digging that hole. Do you want to answer that one, Kate? Yeah, sure. Um, so when you examine maps and see where these older sites are in Alaska, it's pretty clear that they meet a few features. Um, so they're usually near uh, big rivers um, and or some kind of fresh water, so a creek next to that. Um, they're often on some kind of overlook or elevated landform. Uh, and they are often, although not exclusively south facing because in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in high latitudes, those are the places that get the first sun. So after a long dark winter, that's exactly where, where you would wanna be to start 
to warm up. So we just use those features and uh, write our permits and survey in places that we think can answer our questions and, and look for those landforms and start uh, systematic subsurface testing and hoping that we find sites that way. Um, but there, you know, these are their deep tests, so you just have to keep working at it. Um, oh, and that leads to another question that I wanted to make sure to bring up. Um, there's a lot of movement here on my screen which is a lot of those sites, when you look at the map, are actually on the road system in Alaska, in the Tanana and Nanana Valleys. So how do you think that's influenced what we understand about Alaskan archaeology? And what do you think is happening around the rest of the state um, in terms of the first people in Alaska? Uh, that makes me think of, well, OK, so the road is a sample. It's a swath through the wilderness. And Broken Mammoth was discovered when they widened the Richardson Highway um, by Chuck Holmes. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, Kate, uh, our trip down the Cateel uh, River with Ted Gable way out in the wilderness in Alaska, our 10-day float trip. Um, was it the Cateel and the Kayakuk Rivers that we floated down? trying to, we'd float a day and land and then go up and dig and try to find a site and dig all day. And then the next day we would float again. It's really hard to survey wilderness Alaska. It's expensive and hard to get to. So, uh, you know, this being on the road system makes it perfect for field schools because we can drive our trucks in and, uh, um, you know, use the Shaw Creek Archaeological Research um, uh, institute and land there for our base camp. Um, it's still pretty remote for students. We're 90 miles away from Fairbanks, so it still feels very isolated, but it makes a project like this far easier than uh, wilderness. Um, yeah, it biases what we understand about the archaeology for sure. Brian, can you say something? Can you just list out sort of the key methods that we used in the field and distinguish those from the lab methods that the uh, interdisciplinary researchers have been using? Um, and talk about the oldest dates at the site as well. Okay, that's a lot. Um, the excavation methods. So we dig in, the basic unit is a two by two meter excavation unit, which we subdivide into four one by ones. And then we further subdivide into the 16, 50 by 50 centimeter excavation grids. The students measure everything in, piece plot everything. Every bit of charcoal larger than a centimeter is cataloged. And by note in their notebooks, but we also use a a total station or a theodolite to shoot with a laser um, the artifacts as they're recovered and they're cataloged in a central log. So we have two redundant systems of recording artifacts and the precision is down to the millimeter level. So you, the maps that you were seeing were showing our in situ piece plotted artifacts, but there are also hundreds of screen found artifacts, but we know within a 50 by 50 centimeter block where that screen found artifact came from. And we also dig in um, five centimeter levels. So we also know within five centimeters where those screen finds come from. So all the sediments are sifted through one eighth inch screen. Um, we don't want to miss really anything. And because of the nature of this kind of high stakes debate, we have to really demonstrate everything um, spatially in relation to everything else. Um, to, to really put these components together back in the computer. Um, so that's a summary of the excavation methods. When we get down to the lower components, we wear our PPE, and we've been doing this since, we've been making PPE popular since 2016. We wear a face mask, rubber gloves, booties, and we cover things with plastic sheets of visqueen so that we're not introducing anything, including our own um, DNA as much as possible. It's virtually impossible not to contaminate things with DNA um, of the excavators, but we don't want 
our lunch, we sterilize the tools with a solution of bleach um, and the screens. We don't want DNA from our lunch to get into our fauna samples. Um, we learned the hard way when we ran some DNA tests back in 2016 and discovered cow, pig, and chicken in our archaeological fauna. Um, and that told us that, well, one, they did not have domesticated cow, chicken, and pig back then. Uh, we were contaminating the fauna with our DNA, um, probably because we were eating sausage and hard-boiled eggs and cheese while we were excavating. Um, I'm now vegan, so that's our field methods. Um, in the lab areas, we send a lot of stuff out to researchers. Um, I'm glad to see Marjolein on here who's working on lipid analyses and, um, of the hearth samples that we took. Um, we send bulk cards down to Dave McMahon in Tennessee. And when we find something interesting, um, we, we find the people that are interested in working on it and, and we collaborate with them. I'm very grateful for Beth Shapiro's lab at University of California. And you know we wanna get back out to the site so we can take more samples and, and be able to learn more about the environmental DNA and eventually um, DNA from the fauna as well. Um, so I hope, you know, I don't want to go too much more into all these uh, methods because we will be here for another hour. We have another, hopefully that answered the question. So in the last two minutes here, there are quite a few questions. Um, so I just want to pose one to you and also um, we should check in with Julio. He probably has just as many questions as I do. Um, and so on my side, um, this, is, this is a big answer, but are there any controversies um, among archaeologists with any of what was presented today? Um, Go for it. You can have that one there. I don't, I don't want to get involved in that controversial <laughs> stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, controversies are precisely what drives research, right? And that's how we discover um, more refined data and really start to answer some of the big questions. But, um, you know, what we're all trying to work on is what is the timing of the first, you know, archaeological evidence for people in, um, in North, Central and South America? Um, that's a big debate, and we're all trying to find what those first footsteps into the American continents were um, and, and what the timing of that was. So whenever we're talking early timing, there's, um, you're certainly stepping into a controversy there. Um, and, and before we finish out, let's just um, check in with Julio as well. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, so we have a few questions. Um, uh, first, um, I think I think a little bit of one is um, because you clarified what the main research goal of the project is, the main major is, and then what are Julio, I'm having a hard time hearing you there. Better? A little bit better, yeah. Get closer to your mic, maybe. So then, um, if we could clarify the main research goal of the project, uh, what's the biggest takeaway, and then what are our next steps? Okay. Biggest takeaway and next steps. Uh, biggest takeaway, that's a big one. Um, you know, for me, biggest takeaway is that we have people utilizing mammoths at the opening of the ice-free corridor in the north. Now, it's debated when that ice-free corridor opened, but the big debate is, did they come by land or did they come by sea? That's the big debate, along the coast or through western interior uh, Canada. So what we're doing is providing physical evidence that you can see with your eyes they were here in this place doing this thing at that time. Um, you know, it fascinates me that these are people that are colonizing. So you have a keystone species, upper Paleolithic hunters that have come all the way across the mammoth steppe, living a life very similar to what they lived back in France 30,000 years ago, pursuing the biggest game they can find. And so I often wonder is this prestige hunting? Are these teenage boys and girls competing over who can kill the biggest thing on the landscape? And what happens to them when it's harder and harder and harder to find that woolly mammoth? What happens when that's the last woolly mammoth, right? Think of the Lorax in the tree. Do they kill that animal? 
or do they let it live? Now, those are the questions that I'm interested in, I guess, in an ecological capacity. Um, you think about what it was like for some groups of people that may have gotten so far away from their home base behind them, like a population genetics kind of model, it's possible that a band of people wandered the continent without ever encountering another group of people. They, they got too far away and spread too quickly. So there's a lot of things that are fascinating about this story. Um, I guess those are takeaways for me. Any final thoughts there, Kate, before we close this out? Yeah, I think we should just make sure to announce that you can feel free to reach out to us at our um, Adelphi um, email addresses if you have any questions. Um, if you'd like to learn how to get involved and see what's going on, um, you can also find publications from Holtzman um, that way as well. Thank you, everyone. This was a great treat. You know, we planned this thing back in the height of the COVID when all our conferences were being canceled and uh, we decided we would give this a try and I'm glad that you guys joined us. Please feel free to send us any questions. And uh, like I said, I'll distribute the link uh, to the list of participants here. And if you're a professor with students taking this for a class, let me know. I can send you the list of students that uh, showed up for your attendance records too. Thank you. Thanks everybody, be well.